Hello, and welcome to this Apple Land webinar titled Passive Optical Land Points of Inflection. My name is John Hoover. I'm a Apple Land board director. I also chair the marketing committee. And then by day, I'm a marketing director with, uh, with Telabs. And today, I will be acting as your moderator for this webcast. The format is going to be a interactive panel discussion. And we do want to field the questions from the audience as well. So I encourage you all that as our speakers are speaking, please type in your questions into the Zoom Q&A field and we'll get these answered either during the different um, sections or time permitting at the end of the webcast. So please keep typing in your questions as we go. This webcast is being recorded it's going to be placed on our website for replay, and then we will get out a post-webinar email with uh, links to it. So with that, uh, I'm really excited to introduce the speakers of today's webcast. And to make it easy, I will just go ahead and let them introduce themselves. So Gayla, how about you going first? Hey, thank you, John. I'm Gayla Arendelle. I'm the uh, Market Development Director with Corning Optical Communications. I've been with Appaland since the beginning as a founding member, actually, when I was with 3M, that was acquired then by Corning, which was also a founding member, so from the beginning. And I am currently uh, a board director as well as the secretary and on the marketing committee of Appaland. And Jeff? Hi there, my name is Jeff Van Horn. I'm the president of Uber Data Networks. We're a system integrator. We specialize in passive optical land technology, and I'm also on the marketing committee for the Association of Passive Optical Land. And Matt, you have, I think you've been working every webinar this year, so thank you for coming back. Um, how about introducing yourself? Yeah, thank you, John. Uh, yeah, Matt Miller here. Uh, I am with the Technology Solutions Group in AECOM. I lead our networks um, discipline within that group. And I've been participating with Appalan for, well, since the inception. Uh, I serve on the board of, directories, board of directors and the technology committee. Yes. Thank you all for joining us today. And, you know, we wanted to tee up this topic. I think it's a fantastic topic. And we wanted to talk about what truly drives the choice to passive optical land. And how we kind of sliced and diced this was we broke it up. We were first gonna talk about from a regional standpoint, from a geographical regional standpoint. Then we're gonna talk about some of the different industries and their adoption rates. Then we're gonna get into the different building types and properties and how they lend themselves to this uh, passive optical land architecture. Then we're going to ask our panelists to give you some insight into some of the hot technologies that are coming up these days. And, you know, I don't know how to use the correct terms here, but it could be a technology, it could be an application, there may be some blurred lines there, but we'll try to cover as many as we can. And then uh, here's a real interesting conversation. We'll actually get into, uh, when it comes time to choosing passive optical LAN, uh, who are the enablers and blockers when you're positioning this technology? So with that, um, let's go ahead and talk about geographical regions. And the good thing about this topic is that uh, we've done a lot of work with Bizaria on it. And Bizaria is a global research firm. Appalan and Bizaria has done two different studies. Uh, this last one was done in 2019. However, we revved it in 2020, and then it really was published at the beginning of 2021. And it actually covers a lot of the topics that we'll be discussing today. So I encourage you all to uh, go on our website. There's a really good guest blog by Martin Chessia from Bizaria. Uh, about all of these topics written by from the Visaria standpoint. But from a regional standpoint, you know, it, it, it came out that this market was about a $280 million market. And the greatest adoption rate is currently being seen in Asia. You see 34% uh, growth across Asia. Second is North America. And we were going to, you know, we expect that to see that. 
Uh, and then we, there's kind of a tie for third. <laughs> the tie for third is between the Middle East at 14%, and then 14% growth also in Latin America, Caribbean. So like I said, uh, please go to our website, look at this guest blog, and you can get more information about it. But that's kind of where things are growing or where the ad ad adoption rate is uh, increasing the fastest at this point in time. And Bizaria and Appalachian will be doing another study in 2022. So uh, please um, we'll, we'll look forward to the results of that one. So let's get into the, uh, what are the industries that best align with passive optical land? And Matt, I will start with you. And let's talk about hospitality because they really were one of the early adopters of this technology. Yeah, it's funny that you would call on me first to talk about hospitality because here I am sitting in a hotel traveling for business and I got to experience the number two complaint in all of hospitality and that's the internet connection. So oh boy. You hear me. Yeah, so if you hear me break up, uh, don't think of it as breaking up, think of it as uh, driving home the point that the internet connection is important, okay? Um, but, you know, when we talk about hospitality, um, there's a lot of things that make sense with PUL, you're right. I mean, it, it was an early adopter of the technology and for good reason. I mean, they have triple play services that they need to deliver to every one of their guests, right? The voice, data, video connection. And of course, Passive Optical Land is perfectly suited for that. But we also work with a lot of developers that want to save money, right? I mean, we all do, but developers are especially stingy uh, on spending. So a low cost solution that can deliver these triple play services is so incredibly important for them, right? Um, and it also helps that the technology is very future proof, right? So they can look in five or 10 years and say, if we need to upgrade, we've got the infrastructure to support that. We don't have to go in the walls and rip them out because we've all been in those hotels uh, where you can tell that it's an older property and they just don't have a way to upgrade or if they are doing an upgrade, um, it's very intrusive, right? They're, they're tearing open walls to bring new cabling in. And that's just not the case with passive optical land. It's, it's very much um, ready for the future. Okay, good insight. And I'm glad you're out there doing on-site research for us. Thank you. <laughs> uh, you know, um, this isn't an all-inclusive list and we just tried to get some of the high runners. I was kind of looking at some of the Gartner, Gartner defined um, industries. Um, one of the ones that's interesting, I find, I find interesting, and it's kind of an up and coming, is manufacturing. So uh, Jeff, I was wondering perhaps if you could take uh, that topic. Yeah, I'd love to, uh, to, to talk about manufacturing. This manufacturing is a really um, strong growth market right now, um, just with the uh, economic growth that we're seeing uh, here in the U.S., but also in part fueled by lessons learned from COVID. Um, there's a concept of onshoring that, that we've learned over during COVID that we really didn't have enough manufacturing, warehousing, distribution uh, here uh, in the United States to, uh, to, to, to keep supplies up during COVID. And a really good example of that, you look at TSMC and Intel, they're heavily investing in semiconductor manufacturing here in the United States. Um, U.S. usually isn't a place where a lot of semiconductor manufacturing takes place. It's uh, in Asia, PAC primarily, but we're seeing that, that not just semiconductors, but it just in general, there's a lot of growth in manufacturing here in the, uh, the U.S. and then the trends are going to continue. And in passive optical land, that, that, it's a really good space uh, for the technology. There's a lot of growth in, in manufacturing right now. And, and really part of the, the big reasons, two of the big benefits of the, of the fiber optic technology is, is distance and elimination of IDF closets for electronics. And when we look at manufacturing, um, the, the facilities are typically very large from you know, several hundred thousand square feet up to well over 2 million square feet, depending on the facility. And with fiber optic technology, we, we run passive networks up to 12 miles. Um, and that compares to a traditional copper network where we're looking at 100 meters or less. And, and then in manufacturing, floor space is very valuable. Uh, so the, the electronics and the network traditionally are placed on the wall and up in the ceilings. And 
with passive optical lane, if you've been part of our webinars over the years, you'll know that IDF clauses are not needed with passive optical land. So we can really spread out a, a network. And in one of the things with our customers that we always get feedback on is, is, hey, our IT team doesn't need a scissor lift anymore when we use passive optical land because the, the electronics are not up in the ceiling anymore. It's a, it's a passive network. So there's a lot of benefits to the technology. We, we all know the growth in IoT and IIoT technology. When we look at how dynamic and fast changing an environment is in the manufacturing space, um, adding technology, it was called move, add, change work, adding technology locations, reallocating resources on the floor, uh, reducing uh, the time required to make those changes. It's easy to pull fiber optic cable and you've got the distance. So it really helps out the IT teams on, on keeping up the pace of change within their network. And then the, the last point is it, there's, there's a lot of cost savings uh, using this technology in manufacturing, but for our customers in that market segment, the feedback that we always get is the reduction in ongoing operational costs is the biggest benefit that they get. So it's a, it's a great space and, um, and there's a lot of growth going on right now in manufacturing. I hear you, Jeff, and nothing's better than opera saving operational costs because that's a year-over-year -year annuity. Absolutely. But, boy, keeping IT guys off scissor lifts, that's got to be a top priority. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, next up, um, you know, um, there's, there's education, and not just – it's both secondary and – well, primary and secondary, so it's kind of two different – arenas, but Gayla, can you talk about uh, education from a both a K through 12 and university standpoint? Sure. So with COVID and actually during and post COVID, we've probably seen the most significant change in the way that the teachers were meant to teach and students learn. We all have experience of, of our kids at home learning on computers and probably they're back at school now, but it's a bit hybrid. Um, so technology to support teaching and learning and to ensure this, our schools are safe, safe and secure, um, such as high capacity, high availability wireless, both cellular and Wi-Fi, as well as things like security cameras, access control, and now health and occupancy sensors. All of these technologies are what our IT directors are being faced with in terms of making decisions, both for upgrades to existing schools, as well as when they're building new schools. They're also faced typically with very tight and constrained budgets and funding, especially for some of these school districts, are sometimes highly political and also very regulated. So that's kind of what they're facing. We have seen an increasing adoption of passive optical networking in schools and on campuses. Passive optical networks can be up to 30% less expensive to install and maintain as a repair than the traditional copper networks. And where applicable, and we've had a few projects in our, um, in our case where the IT director has been able to um, use his E-rate funds to be able to supplement the cost associated with the POL installations. So, um, so that's that. And then on the campus, you know, if you have multiple buildings on a campus, like you're seeing in this, in this photo here, um, you can actually leverage the extended reach of fiber by centralizing the main distribution frame in one building, and then, then saving on space and equipment as in each of the subsequent buildings that you'll have to connect on the campus. So in the end, a passive optical network really gives the school very much an increased capability and makes it ready for the future, but for a whole lot less, whole lot less than these traditional copper networks. Yeah, and if you ever read the mission and intent of E-Rate, Passive optical land fits right in with that program. And then it'll be interesting to see, Gayla, you know, what type of monies flow down to the education market relative to uh, stimulus programs that are still being worked or have been worked because uh, certainly the kids should get, uh, should get the money because this is really important to our country. Exactly. 
Okay, so let's, that was great. And, um, you know, please submit questions for our speakers and perhaps we can uh, fit them in on these sections as we uh, go through the different categories. But uh, let's move on to the next uh, category. And that would be um, pro property and building types. You know, some are, are um, um, rural, you know, like sprawling properties. And then you may have a, a, a metro downtown hotel that's, uh, you know, a, a high rise, you know, so they can be wide, they can be tall, they come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. Um, so uh, how about we go with um, Jeff, this, the MDU, MTU, it, it's kind of confusing, but they were actually an early adopter. So can you talk about MDU, MTU type buildings and properties? Sure, yeah. So um, MDU multi-dwelling unit, uh, MTU multi-tenant unit, really it kind of compromises apartment, student, student housing complexes, and uh, senior living communities. And yeah, John, you're, you're right. The early days of uh, this technology came from uh, fiber of the home, if you think Verizon, Fios, and AT&T, U-verse, especially with Verizon up in the uh, uh, New England states, a lot of high-density apartment buildings, um, very, very common um, uh, back in the late 90s, early 2000s, when the technology was really taken off in the uh, telco space. Uh, over the years, it's been very, very common in, in apartments, uh, student housing complex, and senior living. And there's a you know, big demand for uh, new building for, for all of those. And here in the U.S., we've got a shortage of about 4 million apartments over the next eight years. So uh, there's a, a lot of uh, 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 building and, and process with developers for apartments. Um, we know how tech-savvy senior live, live, uh, seniors are these days. You know, driven by the baby boomer generation, uh, we've been very active in the senior living space, and it's amazing how senior living facilities are closely mirroring, mirroring what we're doing in hotels, meaning we're pushing a lot of technology into the resident rooms themselves, primarily Wi-Fi and, and Alexa service and things like that. And uh, there's a lot of growth in that, in that area, not only new builds, but uh, from a renovation perspective. And, and looking at a, a passive fiber network in those environments, um, it really excels. And as, as Gala mentioned, in a campus style, uh, for education, well, it's the same thing. You look at apartment complexes that are garden style; they're spread out multiple buildings on a on a campus. And senior living communities certainly are are wide and spread out. When we look at the what the technology can provide, just from the elimination of of space required uh, for for electronics and and some of the devices, we're eliminating the space. We're eliminating closets. And think about it: a uh, an apartment complex. Um, each floor, you typically have a, a communication closet that houses equipment. With the fiber technology, we're able to eliminate that, that, that closet, right? So you can take the surrounding apartments and expand the size. So if you have a larger square foot apartment, you're going to have higher rent. So when we're eliminating space uh, throughout a campus, we're actually increasing the rent. And increasing the rent increases uh, uh, valuation of the property increasing the valuation of the property, increases collateralization for the developer for future building. So a lot of uh, really good benefits there. Um, and, and some of the other things that, that we're seeing with the developers that are starting to take advantage of fiber optic technology, they, they can integrate all of the technologies within their campus. So not just providing, you know, voice video data services to their residents, but they're also integrating in the access control, uh, security cameras, the administrative network, uh, the amenity spaces, since everything collapsed into one network, they can now do mobile services and, and mobile layer two networks so you can print at your printer from the pool. So there's a lot of additional benefits to the residents uh, based on uh, for using this technology. So and in one of the, the, the bigger things that we're seeing when we talk to our developer customers is, is one of the big problems uh, long term with these properties is is changing cable out over the years. They build apartments a little bit different in student housing. It's not easy to switch out the cabling. So when we put in a, 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 a cable like fiber optic cabling that has a 30 to 50 year lifespan, that saves a really big problem for them. So there are a lot of challenges this space has had uh, traditionally over the years. 
and the fiber optic networks are addressing a lot of those challenges for them. Great answer. Okay, so um, kind of similar to manufacturing, I, I'm intrigued by what's going on in warehouse and distribution. Um, Gayla, can you take that one for us? Sure, so yeah, the distribution and fulfillment industry is under significant pressure to meet the demands of consumers. We all are experiencing that in our daily lives now, whether it's automotive or food or bottles, you name it. So this, this industry is feeling the pressure. Um, the, as a whole, the industry is moving towards what they call the industrial internet of things. I think Jeff mentioned this as well. And that is helping distribution centers and warehouses see the higher throughput weights as well decrease their downtime. So what they're doing is they're incorporating real-time asset monitoring systems with tons of IoT sensors into their operations. And all of these are converging over one single network. It's making it really difficult now to discern where traditional sort of IT networks end and where operational technology or OT networks begin. In addition, these facilities are typically very large and open, open space as you can see in this picture. They typically require very long cable runs and with little or no room for pathways as well as these telecom closets. You know, if you, if you thought about put, doing this in a copper type of environment, you will end up having to have rooms in various places where you would have to put the equipment because of the limitations of copper. So for these reasons, passive optical networks are ideally suited for warehousing and logistics. And of course, they deliver virtual fiber delivers virtually unlimited bandwidth, especially single mode fiber over these very long distances. And it also has very low latency and high reliability. All of these resonate with what a, a warehousing and fulfillment industry is looking for. So um, it also enables very easy upgrades to the technology as they add more sensors or you know new. This is an evolving industry, so it hasn't even reached to where it really is going to um, really be at its maximum productivity. Um, so as, these, as this industry continues to evolve and grow, um, we are seeing more and more passive optical networking being incorporated into these type of facilities. Yes, that's good. Uh, I agree. Okay, so uh, Matt, you're up next. Um, how about public venues? I mean, that's kind of a broad topic. It can be so many different things, but um, you want to give a little insight into public venues? Yeah, sure. Um, AECOM does a lot of public venues. That's, that's one of our strong suits. Um, and when we talk about public venues, we're talking about sports arenas, stadiums, uh, convention centers, uh, like performance venues, those types of things where we have huge densities of people. Looks like you're showing a uh, Texas A&M stadium. Um, huge stadium, tons of people, lots of connectivity needs there, right? You can just imagine the challenges that you run up against when you're trying to bring connectivity to this many people in a relatively small space, incredible densities that are made up of that, right? Um, we're talking about wireless connectivity that needs wires, funny enough, right? We need to bring wires to all those wireless access points. We've got point of sale, we've got security, video distribution, uh, many, many other things that need connectivity across this space. And although it is a dense uh, space, it is also geographically large. And when you try to bring connectivity using traditional methods to a space this large, you run into distribution problems, pathway problems. Um, it's really not convenient to have a closet or a enclosure every 250 feet in a space this large. So fiber optics is really the only solution in something like this. And of course, passive optical LAN using fiber optics um, works quite nicely because it can bring connectivity to all those devices that we were talking about. Um, 
And then the other part is the distributed antenna system. Although we don't always run those over a passive optical LAN, it is very complementary to the technology because it's also using that same single mode fiber. So now you can, um, you can have a single cabling solution that does everything for you, right? It's gonna bring your data connectivity for all those devices I talked about. It's gonna bring your cellular connectivity to your distributed antenna system. And we're not having to have those closets or cabinets uh, every few hundred feet for this connectivity. Um, gosh, well, so Texas A&M, of course, is running this technology. There's other large venues like Mercedes-Benz Stadium that have shown that this is a, a huge success for them. And when you get this many people um, into a stadium of this size, they're all consuming bandwidth, right? They're not just watching the game. They're on that that network and they're consuming bandwidth. So the, the, the fiber optic technology and its ability to deliver high amounts of bandwidth across the space is excellent, right? That means that we have stadiums that are pulling more than a hundred gigabits per second of data um, with ease because they're using that fiber optic technology. Yeah, and terabits of, terabits of data from kickoff to uh, end of the game. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so we're right on time. Let's keep going and we, got, we need to move to uh, another topic. So let's uh, try to cover technologies and applications. And once again, I, we, we can't list all the possible upcoming technologies and applications, um, but we have some high runners here. Um, so um, Gayla, uh, Corning does a lot of work with wireless. So I was hoping that you could share some of your uh, knowledge about a wireless and passive optical LAN. Yes, for sure. So, of course, we know wireless coverage and capacity in a building is no longer a nice to have, but a must have. With 80% of mobile usage happening indoors, and I heard the statistic just the other day that uh, the average person has seven devices today, and as that is expected to grow to about 15 devices by 2030. So, Building networks are moving towards what we call a, a universal wireless, or some people call it the wireless first model, which is comprised of, uh, a, of both a Wi-Fi and a cellular in, in the same building. The bandwidth requirements for both Wi-Fi and cellular are increasing significantly and, and actually have become the leading application driving the need for optical networks in buildings. So 5G is here, we hear it all over the television, the news, et cetera. Um, and 5G actually needs very high bandwidth as well as ultra low latency to operate, especially in what they call the millimeter wave frequencies. Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi 6 is now the, new, the newest generation at 6E that is being deployed. But we also know that there's Wi-Fi 7 that will come in the next three to five years. So a new generation is already being formed. Um, Wi-Fi 7 will require up to 40 gigabits per second to operate. Right now we're like in the range of like five to 10. So it, it will be significantly more bandwidth needed for Wi-Fi 7. So with this, we're seeing that the copper networks comprise either of category cable or coax cable in the case of wireless are soon to reach their limits um, of both of bandwidth capacity as well as how cost effectively they can be delivered. Single mode fiber over a passive optical type network is the answer because it delivers virtually unlimited bandwidth and it can support multiple generations of the wireless technology to come. So what we see is that passive optical LAN can support both Wi-Fi today, as well as any of these Ethernet-based small cells that are, that, are, um, that are being deployed in buildings. And then, as Matt was saying, when combined over a converged optical network, so we don't put the DAS on the passive optical LAN, but we use the same cabling infrastructure. And then in that way, we can combine our fiber to the edge DAS solutions with the passive optical LAN in one converged architecture. And in that way, we can fully support this universal wireless strategy that the buildings are having today. Great, great, great. Okay, so uh, let's go to uh, another application. 
And Matt, I, I, I mean, I am bombarded with uh, security things all day long. <laughs> um, it, it is a National Cybersecurity Month, and you know everyone's talking about zero trust and all that. So uh, perhaps you can talk about passive optical LAN and how it impacts security initiatives. Yeah, certainly. And there's many aspects to this, right? Um, when we talk about security, you know, well, okay, you've got the uh, the access control there, right? So that's the the physical security, the electronic security um, to protect the building, right? We work with our security team very closely because all this stuff runs over a network anyway, right? It's just another network uh, in in some ways, but it does have its specialized requirements. Um, Something like this, this card reader uh, is on the perimeter of the building. You're going to have devices all over the place, though, right? If you're talking about a campus or a large building, um, you might have security cameras out in the parking lot. You might have uh, guard booths or gates uh, on the far end of, of a campus. Um, and all these devices need that connectivity, right? So once again, we're back at that distance consideration, right? Copper just isn't going to get you there, right? It simply isn't an option. So passive optical LAN is the logical choice there. Um, the um, And then bringing all of those pieces together is so valuable for the security team. Um, they've got their dashboard um, showing, you know, events, the person swiping their badge, the security camera throwing an alert, those types of things are all being centrally managed that's what's also going on on the passive optical land, right? All those ONTs that are out near the security devices are um, are reporting their status and telling you what's going on on your network. So having that single dashboard uh, for your your passive optical LAN alongside your security systems uh, is is just a perfect uh, marriage of the technologies, right? Um, and the other part of it is just the sheer quantity of devices. We're entering this world of IoT, and I know you didn't call on me for IoT, but it, this kind of mirrors that, right? Because we've just got all these smart sensors um, and security devices throughout the, the, the building that need the connectivity. Um, and to kind of transition to the cybersecurity side of things, uh, it's nice also that Passive Optical LAN has that downstream encryption built in. So that 128-bit AES encryption is a nice little layer to add on to that defense in depth strategy that your devices that need that security connectivity are in fact secured themselves, right? The, the cybersecurity side of that is also locked down. Um, and the last thing I kind of wanted to touch on here was um, something that my security team is always telling me, and that's that they love the guaranteed bandwidth that you get with a passive optical LAN. Um, meaning that, for example, if I have a 4K security camera uh, with a certain number of frames per second and number of megapixels that need to be transmitted across the network, there's a known bandwidth that's required for that camera, right? And with passive optical LAN, I can guarantee that that camera stays online and then is able to transmit its uh, imagery across the network, regardless of what else is going on in the network, right? It's not competing with the user that's downloading a video on YouTube, right? Because that guaranteed bandwidth applies only to that security camera and I can program that into the system. So my security guys love it for that reason. Yeah, and you know, I was gonna mention with 10 gig XGS Pond, that encryption is bi-directional now. Yeah. So that's an added benefit. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, we're right on schedule. Let me um, get one for, for Jeff. Um, so uh, Jeff, um, sustainability is a tough one and it's kind of frustrating for me. So I was hoping you could give some insight as to what is going on with passive optical land and sustainability. You know, great, great topic, John. This is something when we talk to our customers that, that comes up very often, especially when we're working with their executive team. Um, you know, one of the, the, the common topics is, is ESG, which is environmental, social, and corporate governance. Um, a lot of our customers, especially public companies, they have official statements and initiatives on, on how they are reducing their corporate impact on the earth and our natural uh, resources. Uh, a lot of companies have zero net carbon initiatives to become zero net carbon by a, a certain year. So yeah, very, very big topic, very broad, a lot of uh, 
uh, a lot of factors involved, but passive optical land does uh, play a very uh, prominent role in this. And so I came in this morning, um, read the news, and, and one of the first articles that came up was uh, the, uh, uh, an article on the copper shortage due to, of all things, electric vehicle growth. And, and looking at electric vehicles, they say that the electric vehicles have over three and a half times the amount of copper per vehicle compared to uh, comparable internal combustion vehicles. So now we're, we're, we're seeing copper shortages that are driving up costs, that are they're gonna have uh, supply chain issues down, down the road. So when, when we look at what we're doing with passive optical land, we're using fiber optic cables and, and the fiber itself is made of silica. And silica is one of the top two most abundant resources on, on earth. And so we've got a very positive message when we work with our customers. And one of the, the big impacts is on the, the fiber infrastructure. Um, it has a much lower impact on the earth itself. So just think about manufacturing cabling itself, which is the first step in putting in a cable infrastructure in a building is building the cable itself. So building a, a category cable, a Cat6 cable specifically, uh, it requires 200 times more natural earth resources to manufacture compared to a fiber optic cable of a given linear foot. And that's everything from the raw materials to the energy utilization, to the transportation um, of just making the cable itself. So we're just to start off with, we're looking at 200 times greater impact to the earth just by building the cable itself. And then when we put the cabling inside these facilities, you know, we have the weight associated with it. We have the larger pathways and support systems. So think about the cable trays that are needed above the ceiling hmm. to support the weight of the cabling. So there are a lot of, we're putting a lot of material inside of a building with a traditional category uh, cabling system compared to fiber optic system, uh, which is much lighter and easier to manufacture. And, and then on top of that, with the traditional cable infrastructure, every, on average, every seven years, um, you migrate, you refresh the cable. So you're gonna go from a Cat 5E to a Cat 6, a Cat 6 to a Cat 6A. Uh, so when you, when you refresh the cable and you took, take the old cabling out, uh, we'll, we'll recycle the copper, uh, but the plastics and insulated material goes into the landfill, right? So now every seven years, we're putting that discarded material back in the landfill. And when you look over, say like a 30 year lifespan, fiber optic cabling last 30 to 50 years. So you look at a 30 year life cycle, you're refreshing a category cable plant, say four times, and that's all hitting the, uh, the landfill. So uh, a big impact long-term over the impact to the earth. Um, and then with passive optical land, it has a big reduction in CO2 um, uh, generation, just the amount of power utilization for these fiber networks is significantly lower. So the amount of CO2 load on the planet uh, is reduced just by the reduction of the amount of power. So uh, when, you, when you look at the, compare the two just from a cradle to grave perspective of the entire life cycle of these IT systems, the passive optical land has a huge positive impact on corporate sustainability initiatives. Yeah, yes, and I just, I don't see people really taking advantage of that. So that was why I started out my started out the question by saying I'm a bit frustrated. So hopefully people can start utilizing this technology and really going after these certification programs uh, with these benefits that you just talked about. Okay, so let's uh, keep moving. We're, we're, we may be a, a minute or two behind, but this was the best section I really wanted to get to. And we actually did have a question about it. Um, so, you know, okay, so there may be a decision to go with either a traditional network or a passive optical land network, and you're trying to position it with all the different stakeholders. How do you do that? And Matt, one of the reasons why we invited you onto this webinar was we really wanted to get your insight on uh, architects, consultants, and engineers. So how about you going first? Yeah, I mean, I work with these guys every day, right? That's what AECOM is primarily, is an architecture and engineering company. Um, so I've become the architects and engineers best friend because I am able to save them the important things when we come into the building, the space, the power, and the cooling. So when that architect comes to me and says, we've got a space problem, 
talk to me about telecommunications closets, I can say to them, well, are they doing passive optical LAN? And if the answer is no, uh, I can quickly get that architect on board with passive optical LAN because I can say, well, what if we could get rid of or greatly reduce how many telecommunications closets are on that floor? And all of a sudden, there I am as their best friend, right? Because that's what their job is, right? Is, is to manage space and efficiently use it. And a telecommunications closet to an architect is just a thorn in their side, right? It's, it's this necessary evil that, uh, that they have to deal with that consumes space. So uh, it's an easy sell to an architect. It's not even a sell, it, right? All I have to do is say, I can give you space back and they're done, right? That's all they care about. Um, on the engineering side, it's a similar story, right? They're doing the power, the cooling, those types of things. Um, if I can reduce the number of closets, then I'm also reducing the power consumption and the cooling consumption, right? Instead of having all this concentrated devices in closets and instead efficiently distributing my electronics uh, throughout the building with all the other gear, um, all of a sudden, the engineers are also very happy. So, um, so those are my favorite people to deal with because they think I'm I'm just you know their best friend. Um, now, on the consultant side, they're the ones that are often doing this advising to to their clients, right? Um, and this is an opportunity for them to be a hero, um, to bring in innovation, forward-thinking ideas that can make these big differences to the architects and engineers, right? And by the way, also save money. So for a consultant, this is something that you should have in your back pocket whenever you're talking about connectivity, because uh, like I said, you can uh, all of a sudden be the guy with all the great ideas that save the company money. Um, and if you can go to the IT designers and say, you know, those 200 foot circles you draw around the telecommunications closet, you don't have to do that anymore, then you've also won them over as well. So yeah, I love this group. Okay, we need more of them. <laughs> okay, on board with the technology. Um, okay, so um, kind of a broad topic, but and we'll just kind of lump them all together. Uh, Jeff, uh, how about when you try to position this with the the C suite, the, uh, the 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 company leaders? Yeah, we. We have really strong relationships, and we we tend to um, uh, uh, work with the the executive teams. Uh, a lot of a lot of customers, when you when you look at the lower levels and the IT um, uh, teams, they they cannot be as sometimes they're not as accepting as you would like them to be, just to just due to, uh, to to the perceived risk that they have. We work with executive teams quite a bit, and and I guess more the. CFO and CIO are probably the two that we uh, engage with the most. Um, you know, with with the with the sustainability initiatives and, and companies having having conversations around ESG, that makes the conversations at the executive level much easier and more open. Uh, by far, the chief financial officer is the greatest enabler. If you're if you're going to kind of rank them. Um, you know, the CFO has the ultimate fiduciary responsibility for the corporation, and they make decisions solely based on quantified analysis, right? Usually spreadsheets, right? So when, when we look at the undeniable benefits with passive optical land, and we can all go through a, a you know, to, total cost of ownership analysis and present that in front of the CFO, there's immediate interest and there's, there's immediate value recognized there. So the CFO always tends to be a champion for the technology based on what it re represents to the company in a positive way. Um, CIO can, can fall into a couple different categories. We usually see CIOs as either an innovator or a traditionalist. Um, a lot of innovative CIOs, they're, they're always looking for technologies and solutions that, that um, have a positive impact on the company, positive impact on their workers, uh, reduce workload on their teams, things like that. And, and they tend to embrace the technology. And even if they embrace the technology, it doesn't mean that it's always a, a great fit for the organization, um, but they will tend to drive it down into their IT teams and have their IT teams go in and validate or try to invalidate the use of the technology. And it turns into a very engaging process. Uh, but there are, there are times where the CIO can be definitely be a blocker Kind of the more traditionalist 
that are, you know, don't want to upset the apple cart. Um, my team is fully certified and vendor, you know, whoever, and they don't want to uh, change the status quo. And, and there are times where we've worked with uh, primarily lar much larger corporations where their methodologies and processes are, are so widespread that introducing a new technology within a given time frame of a particular project just doesn't uh, just doesn't fit. So it's not that they're a blocker, but there's a lot of good conversation that goes on at the C level. But the one thing that we do see is the executives t always tend to overcome roadblocks uh, with analytical thinking. They they tend to remove the emotional conversations and decisions that are made at the lower level. So we do spend a lot of time at the uh, C suite level. Yeah, I know we we, we threw in CMO. Chief Marketing Officer there, that might be a little bit comical, but nonetheless, you know, putting fiber <laughs> inside buildings actually can increase the value of a building. And so, you know, maybe the CMO might be interested in it. <laughs> okay, uh, Gayla, uh, we were hoping that you would cover, talk about working with general contractors and integrators and installers. Okay, so general contractors can be both an enabler as, or a blocker, depending on, as we said, if they're, a, if they're an innovation company or a traditionalist, as Jeff puts it. Um, however, more and more we're seeing that the general contractors are forming smart building teams within their organization and performing full design build projects. So um, they are essentially acting in a lot of projects as the technology super integrator for the, for the ever increasing scope of the low voltage and medium voltage of their builds. What we have heard a statistic that with the, uh, with the more and more technology being added into these smart buildings, what was typically about two to 3% of their total budget for the IET spend is now upwards of 10%, sometimes 10 to 15% of their total budget. So all of a sudden it's, you know, it's significant and relevant. Um, so these GCs are starting to think differently about how they converge their networks and how, and they're also embracing a lot of these smart building technologies, including the use of uh, passive optical LAN in the design and build. And thereby they're being able to deliver to their clients a cost-effective and a truly future-ready, sustainable smart building. That being said, not all GCs are innovators, so there are some traditionalists out there. And um, many times we hear the word value engineer, and sometimes value engineering knocks out many of these new technologies that are being proposed, or they typically don't understand the new technologies and the value they can get. So um, one thing with, with passive optical LAN that I'll make note of here, especially in the budgeting process, is where you put the actives and where you put the passives. That's quite different to a traditional network where you know the low voltage is typically passives and then the actives kind of come get handled um, when they're doing the final sort of integration. Um, so that's one challenge and, and it can be especially challenging to us uh, who, when we're selling passive optical land projects, especially in new construction. Last but not least, I want to stress, I cannot stress enough actually, the value of having a qualified, experienced integrator, as well as having installers that are trained and experienced in fiber. The key to any successful project that we've done is having both of these skill sets. Sometimes they are not the same company. Sometimes you have an integrator that doesn't do the fiber, but they have to work hand in hand with somebody who comes in and can install the passives as they do the actives and the commissioning. So most integrators also offer a, a, a services and support program to ensure the site is monitored and managed effectively post install. So anybody considering um, any one of these projects, uh, please make sure that you uh, get in touch with, we have one of them on, on, the, on this webinar with us here in Jeff, but get, and also in Matt actually. So please make sure you work with somebody who's qualified and experienced in doing these jobs. Yes, and by visiting the Apple Land website, um, you will find other 
qualified integrators and installers. Okay, we're uh, right on time. Um, let me get, this is the Q&A part of this panel discussion. And uh, we have some questions already submitted, but just to give you some time to type some more, let me give you just a quick introduction into the Association of Passive Optical Land. We're really here to do the advocacy and education of this technology globally. We're a group of manufacturers, installers, integrators, consultants, and we're all coming together trying to um, build up this, this, this technology in this, this market. And we are, you know, here's what, here's what you would find when you went to the website. We are a group of, uh, like I said, manufacturers, integrators, and installers, and uh, consultants. Please visit our website to see all of these uh, folks that are engaged in this industry. And, and I want to encourage you all, if you're not already a member, to join. You can help impact industry research like Visaria. You can help with events and trainings like we do at Bixie and webinars like we're doing today. Uh, and then you can also influence uh, news and social media by writing articles and getting them published. Uh, that's another great way to build value for the company you represent. So please uh, go on the website and if you're not already a member, uh, look to join up with us. Uh, with that, let's, let's get to the questions. And I have one that I want to get out, get out real quick and um, I'll just give it to Matt. Uh, somebody did ask about ONT powering, you know, and how that is done in these large cavernous places like warehouses, manufacturing and distribution using hybrid copper and fiber cabling. Can you really quickly address that? Yeah, sure. Uh, the nice thing is uh, you have options when it comes to powering the ONTs. Um, if you have power conveniently there at the location, then you can simply plug in the ONT right there and, and, and have it online. Um, if that's not an option, then a uh, hybrid or composite cable, um, as they're sometimes called, um, is your answer there, right? It brings power and your fiber all in one jacket. So either one can be an option. Okay. Um, Jeff, in, in industries, uh, there is a question about um, uh, federal government, state and local governments. So can you give a little insight into uh, the government space and passive optical land? Yeah, that, you know, government, that was really one of the first areas where this technology saw widespread success outside of the, the telco, telco space that we talked about earlier. You know, the government agencies uh, really embraced this technology back in 2009, 2010, and, and really the, the, the big value to them with the technology was the physical security associated with the fiber optic cabling, um, especially in classified networks. It's, as Matt mentioned earlier, the, the, the passive optical LAN has encryption um, and now it's bi-directional encryption with the new XGS PON technology. So with encryption and the ability to use fiber optics with, with active monitoring systems on the fiber optics, um, government networks can eliminate the need for external encryption devices. Um, there are things called periodic visual inspections uh, that need to take place with copper cabling just to protect the infrastructure those aren't needed with fiber optic infrastructure. So the government really kind of kind of uh, uh, took this on very early on, and and then state and local uh, unit municipal networks and and uh, state like K through 12 and education, uh, there is an awful lot of activity in those spaces today. Yeah, it was always nice with the federal government because they put out an RFP. And you'd answer a hundred page RFP, and you could say yes, 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 yes. Passive optical land does this, and oh, by the way, it costs less. And so with that centralized purchasing, purchasing there's a really easy, kind of an easy sell in the Fed Cup. So uh, that, I think that helped them as early adopters. Okay, uh, next up, uh, someone was surprised that we didn't cover smart buildings. Uh, and uh, Gayla, I know you're very active at the TIA and smart buildings. So uh, how about you? Uh, can you speak a little bit to pass off to land and smart buildings? Yes, of course. So yeah, I am actually um, Corning is founding member of the TIA Smart Building Program, and I'm an, an active member in that working group. So I am very much involved in the whole topic of smart buildings on a daily basis. Um, according to TIA, uh, they, they quote that only when all building systems are fully integrated and sharing data, so that they can be managed through a single plane of glass with minimal human intervention, 
can a building truly be considered smart by today's expectations? That's that's a quote from their, their website, actually. So to be honest, when you think about fiber and passive optical networking, um, it's a very, it's an extremely valuable um, asset in the development of a truly integrated building system to become a smart building, right? So the more applications that get layered into a smart building, and this can be from the IT side, whether it's you know the Wi-Fi or, or the, the sensors, et cetera, but equally amount in, in considering the OT side of the business. This is the building management system and the HVAC controls and the energy sensoring, you name it. Um, the greater the need to converge these networks into one architecture that can then deliver the bandwidth, the latency, and the security, cybersecurity included, uh, that a building may need now and into the future. So in order to get to this sort of like single pane of glass, completely and in fully integrated um, network within a building that's operating as a smart building, single mode fiber and passive optical networking is truly a very valuable piece of the equation to get to that sort of future ready sustainable state that is everybody's looking to get to. Thanks for sharing on that. Um, okay, so here's a question and here's a good one. Uh, someone asked about network administrators, and I guess we conveniently forgot to talk about the IT and the networking guys and gals. Um, Matt, you want to take that one on? Yeah, I'm one of those guys, so I can talk about <laughs> them, right? I think that's how that works. Um, yeah, I mean, these this group is an interesting one because they can uh, they could they could go either way on this thing. Um, if they are innovators and forward thinkers, then they could be your best friend, right? Because they're interested in this new technology and a new way of doing things. Um, but if they've been doing the same thing, they've got a certificate on the wall that says they have been doing the same thing for 20 years and, and they should continue to do that through retirement, then they're going to be uh, one of those blockers like we talked about, right? Um, in, in their mind, it may be that, you know, the, the traditional way of doing things um, has always worked and I have no reason to change. Uh, and that's because they're not concerned about savings or power or space or cooling, right? Uh, often it's the, C, the CXOs, right? The C-suites like Jeff was talking about, um, they care about those things. So unless you've got an innovator, uh, a forward thinking IT department, um, usually it's best to go after the, um, the ones that control the budgets and the power and the space and the cooling. And, and then they'll put it upon the IT team to, um, to refute it, right? And figure out why, why they shouldn't do it, right? Because those are, those are where the drivers are. So, so yeah, it really just depends on, on who they are. But, um, but it, it's, uh, it's not always the IT folks that you want to go after first on this. It's the people that, will, uh, that have that vision for the future. Yeah, okay. And, and you know, um, how do you win them over? I mean, um, you know, do you talk about the fact that perhaps maybe their, their, their staff has already been scaled back and this is a technology that helps them, you know, is easier to manage the network? I mean, what are your ways to win them over? Yeah, I mean, for them, it's, it's often fear of the unknown that's got them on the defensive about this, right? When they realize that it can do the same things that their existing network does, it's just doing them in a different way. Um, once they have that education, they realize that, that their knowledge will apply to this and that this isn't a threat to their job and will actually make it easier, uh, then all of a sudden you can switch them in their ways. Yeah, sometimes they don't realize that there are options for uh, the CLI. You know, some guys can't, gals can't get away from the CLI and there are some options for that, but we truly do want people managing these networks moving forward from a centralized management one pane of glass. But, you know, there's, there's a way we can make this transition a little bit easier for the network administrators and IT folks. Exactly. Okay, we are at the top of the hour. Um, and, you know, I wanna thank uh, our speakers for uh, joining us today and sharing their knowledge, their deep knowledge in this topic. Um, like I said, we recorded this, we'll send out a post email with a link to the replay, but a little heads up, it will go up on our website.
And we're going to try to do one more web webinar before the end of the year. So keep an eye out for that one. That one will be led by our technology committee. If we didn't get to any of your questions, uh, please contact us at the at the um, email uh, on your screen. And also, you know, check out our website. Look at the the Bizaria report. Uh, look at uh, our, our different integrators and, and installers like we talked about. So lots of great wealth of knowledge there. So with that, I will bid you all have a great day and a great rest of your week.